Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And tonight we're going to be talking to you about runes. After a fair amount of stuff we want to get through first. <laughs> right. <laughs> because the very first thing we have to say is, if you're listening to this far in the future, that's an optimistic thought, Mark, isn't it? <laughs> we are recording this right at the very end of March 2020, the longest month I have ever lived through. <laughs> and we're at home, as many people are, because of the coronavirus and COVID-19, and so I just feel like we have to address that at the beginning yeah. of this. <laughs> but, you know, one thing you can do when you're, you know, locked up in your house is record a podcast. So. Yep. So we're finally getting to it, though. You might think we'd have all the time in the world to do that now. But because both of us are teachers at a university which went online with less than 24 hours notice on March 12th, I believe... <laughs> The last few weeks have been pretty nonstop for us. Mm -hmm. We just sort of had to turn around and put all our classes suddenly remote. We had no warning. So anyway, we, that's fine. You know, we both are at least accustomed to online things. That helped. Mm -hmm. But it's been pretty busy. And the kids have been home since two days after that for March break. And then for the last two weeks. And we now have been told they'll be home for another month, which is totally to be expected. And frankly, I don't think they're going back this year. So that's also added to <laughs> our life. So anyway, we're fine. We're good. We're healthy. We have lots of things to make cocktails. So yeah, lots of things to make cocktails with. Uh, a couple of our local businesses are doing deliveries and uh, no touch pickups and things. So we've done that. But we've been pretty much staying at home. We've gone out only for groceries and booze. And <laughs> <laughs> for the last, is it three? It's almost three weeks now, eh? It's as long I, as that. Wow. Well, this. This Wednesday will be three weeks from the day uh -huh. classes were canceled. And I guess we went out sort of Thursday and Friday for various things. But of that week. Time loses all meaning. I know. It really it's, feels it's like it's... either been like a year since we... <laughs> this all happened or... Or like yesterday. Yeah. So anyway, so we haven't had tons and tons of time. We finally got a video out, which took us forever and ever to do. But we finally got that out. Now we're doing the podcast. I would love to say that because of all this, we're going to be doing more podcast episodes more quickly. I don't think that's going to be true. This is the last week of term, but we have exams to get through, which are now take-home exams, and it's all very complicated. So uh, it's going to be a little while before things slow down for us. Yeah. And goodness knows what the world will look like in a week or two weeks. Things are changing so quickly. Anyway, we really hope everybody out there is safe and well, surviving, being locked down, or having to work if you do doing whatever you do, if you're working at the many jobs that are frontline in various different ways, thank you. If you're not and you're not working, I'm sorry. And if you're at home, slowly losing your mind, I'm sorry about that too. <laughs> I hope this can at least distract you for a bit because we are not going to be talking about disease. I did no. briefly thought, think about doing, doing an, episode an episode on, on medieval disease or something, but we decided no. We're just going to go ahead with what we were planning to do, which is talk about runes and a video that we did on runes quite a while ago. So maybe this will give you some distraction. So enough. I don't think there's anything else we have to say about that. Patreon. We have a couple of new Patreon supporters to thank. Jordan Mackey and Corey from 12 Tone. That's a YouTube channel that if you have not seen, you should check out. Uh, music Theory. Thank you, both of you. Mm -hmm. And yes, do, do check out uh, 12 Tone. It's one of my favorite channels. Mm-hmm. Related to that, however, is uh, we are going to, as I said, this is the 31st of March, and we decided this afternoon we're going to pause our Patreon, I don't know exactly what it's called, the donations or whatever, like pause the charging mm -hmm. for at least for April and maybe the next couple of months. As I said, because we're teachers, our jobs haven't been affected, and we're very lucky that way. And while the money from the Patreon does definitely help us with the costs that come from servers and services and various other things related to doing the videos and the podcasts, we are in a position to absorb that cost for a little while. And we just don't want to add to the costs of so many people who might not be able to right now, even a dollar or two or $5 a month, you know, that can matter if you suddenly don't have a job. 
So we're going to pause it. If you are a Patreon supporter and you still do have some financial stability, we'd love it if you took that couple of dollars and gave it to another creator, maybe. There's a lot of creators who do depend on their Patreon money or other kinds of, you know, who do creation full time and for whom it's it's really tough. Or to, you know, give it to a charity or give money to somebody who can use it. Um, it don't, of course, if you don't want to. But, you know, that's one of the things we thought people might be able to do. Mm -hmm. And we'll give notice on the Patreon site before we turn it back on. So you will know you're going to be charged for the next month. Our other big announcement is about the launch of an app and uh, group. Uh, yeah, community app and platform, I mm -hmm. guess. Yep, yeah. called Lyceum. And what it is, is it's a platform all about educational podcasting. And so there are a whole bunch of really fantastic educational podcasts on this new platform, including us. Mm -hmm. And it's really set up so that, you know, people who are particularly interested in educational podcasts can find the, the stuff they want to find, find the creators they want to find, mm -hmm. um, and interact with those podcasts. Just a nice little home for, for yeah. people who are, you know, really into that sort of thing. They're doing things like putting together collections of themed podcasts, podcasts on different mm -hmm. topics or on larger subjects, they're going to continue to do that. So this is a, a launch of a beta version of the app. Like there's still going to be more development with it, but there's they're doing sort of collections that's on the app itself. There's discussion forums for each show. They're definitely focused on sort of recommendations from creators for other creators. Mm -hmm. And they are, you know, hand curating and checking out the shows that they are putting on the the app so it's not just anyone who applies mm -hmm. i mean they're also definitely not focused on you know only big shows yeah. or we would be on there <laughs> <laughs> but they're in, focused on shows that are good and thoughtful good and yeah, yeah and and give the kind of educational experience that people are looking for yeah so yeah so it's lyceum.fm that's l y c e u m.fm is the website right now most of the functionality is only on the app but you can learn about it on the website. And I think they are planning to make it available on yeah, desktop there's, there's eventually. Gonna be, there's going to be a web app mm -hmm. uh, eventually. So, But it's not there yet. Yeah. But yeah, so if you go check us out there, we do have a discussion post posted. I mean, there's not a lot of discussion yet. It only launched a couple of days ago. But do feel free to talk to us there or just go and take a look at the various shows that are there. If you are yourself a podcast creator, there's also on the website, there's um, information for applying to be on the app. And I would encourage it because one of the things that there is from the back end that's so good for us and that we really like is that they're developing a community of creators. So there's a place for creators to talk and, you know, share ideas and problems and ask for advice and d discuss the sorts of things that podcast creators care about that maybe nobody who's not a podcast creator cares about. And we have, you know, we have that community with videos with We Create EDU, mm -hmm. and it's been so special and important to us. And to be able to start developing that community with podcasters, it's really nice. Yeah. So so that's something if you are a podcast creator that I would definitely recommend. Absolutely. And and by the way, we will try to post, you know, some sort of points of for discussion or mm -hmm. questions on our forum there. Mm -hmm. So head over there and, you know, join in the conversation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so Lyceum, check that out. All right, I think we're on to cocktail. Yes. <laughs> so since the topic today is, is runes, which, you know, are an important part of Germanic culture, and in particular, the Northern Germanic, the Scandinavian mm -hmm cultures, we decided to look for a, a cocktail that was somehow sort of Viking-y. Well, we looked for runes, but there was no, nothing. Right. So, yeah. so then we <laughs> then looked we for, Vikings. Look for Vikings. <laughs> and we found a cocktail that is sort of Viking-y. It has Viking in the name. It does. But it, I think in the end, it ended up being very appropriate because it's completely made up. <laughs> it started with the name and worked backward. Yeah. I mean, all cocktails are made up. I understand that. But you, but this is one that has like no authenticity, no claim to it at all. 
And as I think you'll discuss a little bit when you talk a bit, uh, the runes and sort of Viking culture have kind of suffered from that and the use of runes in the modern world of mm -hmm. people starting from that and sort of backfilling it with a story uh, yeah, that isn't, became, has no authenticity. It became very occulty in the 19th mm -hmm. century mm -hmm. with no direct connection to uh, actual historical practice. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a meta way in which mm -hmm. this is. So the would you like to tell us the story <laughs> of this Vic, of this uh, cocktail? Well, for those of you old enough to remember, there was a television show called Cheers. Mark said to <laughs> me when he was talking about that, he's suggesting this cocktail. He said, um, did you ever hear of a show called Cheers? <laughs> I, I nearly slapped him. I was like, what do you think I am? She hardly watched television as a child. There's a lot of shows she doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, who doesn't know Cheers? Well, I'm okay. not, unless you are younger, but I'm in my 40s. I know Cheers. Anyway, yes. yes. So the show Cheers. <laughs> well, there, so there was a joke on this show in which to get the bartender Woody his job back because they had another sort of very professional hot shot bartender. bartender. Yeah. yeah. And so to sink this other guy, they sort of formed this scheme in which they, everyone would like come in and ask for this made up cocktail and he wouldn't know how to make it, but Woody would. Woody's in on it. So he would know, you know, he would pretend to know what this cocktail was. Mm -hmm. And that cocktail was called the Screaming Viking. <laughs> So of course in the in the show they don't explain what it is. No. Um but the only thing they mention is the only ingredient cucumber, cucumber. Br bruised cucumbers, yeah. yeah. But people have of course gone ahead and figured it out or figured it out. Made up a cocktail. Yes. So we went and found on Spruce Eats a cocktail recipe for it. So we are we are drinking a screaming viking. Yes. Now part of the joke was they all then pretended to drink whatever crazy concoction yeah. that he made and they sort of didn't Hated swallow. Yeah. And as soon as the guy walked out of the room, they all spit it out. So as we'll if see it's if, not good, but yeah, yeah. so we'll, we'll see how we'll this see. is. So cheers. cheers. Well, it's not that bad. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I knew what went into it. It couldn't be that yeah. bad. <laughs> so all it is, is it's vodka, dry vermouth and lime juice and garnished with a cucumber and a celery, a cucumber spear and a, a celery stick. Mm -hmm. And ours have been sitting because we were prepping this for so long for quite a while. So it actually tastes quite a lot of cucumber. <laughs> yeah. And it, it has the, you get the, yeah. the, mm. the nose of the mm. cucumber. It's very tart. Mm -hmm. There's no sweetness to it. But so, yes, yeah, so we're having the screaming Viking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Viking part of which has clearly no connection to anything actually Viking, but it still mm. amused us. And uh, perfectly tasty. But it's a good joke on crazy cocktail names, I suppose. <laughs> it is that too. Because, you know, they do sometimes have ridiculous, ridiculous names, ridiculous names yeah. like that. So, All right. So what are we going to be talk, uh, listening to and then talking about, Mark? Well, this, so this was originally from a video that we did quite a while ago, and it was a collaboration with another uh, YouTube channel called Native Lang. For the record, this was just before Native Lang uh, yeah. went viral exploded <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with his hot latin video yeah. i still love the fact that that's what took him that's viral it. Yeah. <laughs> it <was> latin <laughs> never took me viral but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we we did this as a kind of two-parter in which native lang did a video his video was entitled muslim vikings and magic letters the odd history of runes part one and then my video was Guns, Thorns, and Smartphones, The Odd History of Runes, Part 2. So basically, the Native Lang talks about kind of the origin of the runes or some possibly apocryphal story, mm -hmm. but the origin of the rune. And runes cheese. And cheese. And, and some general facts about the runic alphabets. And then I talked about the runes in, as they're used in England. And then the later history of the runes after the Middle Ages and through all that kind of occult stuff and whatnot. So what we'll do now is listen to the voiceover for that video and then come back. And I think you have some more things you want to talk about after that. And we've got some discussion about early writing systems yeah. um, and the history of early writing. And we'll also include in the show notes a link to Native Lang's video. Oh, of course. Yeah. So you can go and It's very out. fun. It's you very should good. definitely yeah. see it. The runic system that was used in Anglo-Saxon England and Scandinavia before the arrival of Christian missionaries was rarely employed for writing extended texts, mainly just inscriptions and such like. 
Once the missionaries arrived, though, it didn't take long for the new converts to come up with the idea of using the Latin alphabet for writing down not just Latin, but also their own language. Just one problem. Or maybe a couple, actually. There were some sounds in the various Germanic languages that just didn't exist in Latin, so there were no letters to use to write them down. For instance, both the voice th, as in modern English either, and the voiceless th, as in ether, didn't exist in Latin, though a similar sound from ancient Greek was represented as th in Latin contexts. In early Old English manuscripts, the sound was represented as the digraph, that's two letters together making one sound, th, or simply as the letter d. But eventually, a diacritic stroke was added to that letter D to differentiate it from a regular letter D to make a symbol we now refer to as ETH. And a little later, another solution to this missing sound also began to be used. One of those old runic characters, the thorn, as it was called in Anglo-Saxon, or thurs, meaning giant or ogre, in Old Norse. You see, though the runic writing system is an alphabet representing sounds, not an ideographic system, the characters have meaningful names. These two characters, either ETH or the runic thorn, could be used for either TH or th. Old Norse manuscripts followed suit with first the letter thorn and a little later the ev, with the added twist that thorn came to be used only as the initial letter in words and ev in other positions, whereas in Old English the letters were used interchangeably. Another runic character was pressed into service as well, the win meaning joy, to represent the w sound. In Latin, the letter u was used for both the vowel u and the consonant w. Actually, in the earlier Old English manuscripts, the letter U was used for W, but eventually, to avoid confusion between the vowel U and the consonant U, the runic win was adopted. Of course, to our modern eyes, the runic win looks an awful lot like the letter P, so modern printed editions of Old English texts replace all the wins with our modern W, a character that came about a little later by joining up two Vs or two Us, the double U. But if you're reading actual manuscripts from the period, you have to mind your P's and well, wins. Actually, we're kind of prone to mixing up those old runic characters and Roman letters. That's what happened with those ye olde shop signs, in fact. You see, the thorn hung around for a while after the Old English period, gradually becoming less and less common, and as it did so, the form of the character became less and less distinct, with the ascender, that perpendicular line on the side, becoming shorter. So the thorn looked more like the win, which by the 14th century had disappeared, and like the P. Confusing. And, by the 15th century, it looked a lot like the letter Y, so that when the printing press came along, printers would often use the Y in place of thorn, though by that point, the TH digraph had mostly replaced it, with the thorn being used in common words like the, often represented in text as Y standing in for thorn with a superscript E. So what looks like Y-E, ye, was actually thorn-E, the. So it should really be pronounced the old shop. But that's not nearly so quaint. One last way that runes were worked into English back in those old Anglo-Saxon manuscripts was as a type of secret code. A few individual rune signs were dropped into the otherwise Latin script, which would be put together to spell out the answer to a riddle or the name of the author, as in this poem by Cunewulf. It's no coincidence that runes were used in this secretive way, since rune itself is not only Old English for runic character, but also meant secret or mystery, and counsel or consultation. It comes via Proto-Germanic, probably from an Indo-European root meaning roar or murmur, which also gives us the words rumor, riot, and raucous. The word mostly faded from the language along with the runes themselves after the Anglo-Saxon period, only to be added back in by scholars in the 17th century and later who were studying those old runes. But there is at least one hidden remnant of the word in the place name Runnymede. You see, Runnymede in Surrey was where Anglo-Saxon kings held council meetings with their various nobles, aldermen, thanes, and so forth. Remember the council meeting of Rune? The so-called Witena Yamat, literally meeting of the wise men, which, by the way, inspired J.K. Rowling's Council of Wizards, the Wizengamot. So Runnymede literally means Rune Island Meadow, and it's therefore appropriate that, in the year 1215, the feudal barons of England, who were, I suppose, raucous and ready to riot, buttonholed King John and forced him to accept the Magna Carta, which limited the powers of the tyrannical king. Not that he kept to his agreement, but rescinded it shortly afterwards. Nevertheless, Magna Carta marks an important milestone in constitutional history. Getting back to those runes themselves, for the most part their use faded with the Middle Ages, but they were later revived with Gothicism and the interest in the ancient Germanic past in the 18th and 19th century. 
This was a factor in the growing nationalism of German Romanticism, which celebrated, and to some degree fabricated, a romanticized version of Germanic history, of which runes were a part. Furthermore, the runes fed into the esoteric and occultist fascination of figures such as Austrian mysticist Guido von Liszt, who developed the Arminen runes, and inspired by them, Karl Maria Villegut, who developed his own version of the runes in the 20th century. And that's the next link in our chain, because this was exactly the sort of thing that caught the interest of the Nazi occultists, particularly Heinrich Himmler, who incorporated these runes into various Nazi insignia, most famously the insignia of the Schutzstaffel, the so-called SS. Another script-related thing that the Nazis were into, at least at first, was the old black letter or fracture typeface, which had developed from the Gothic manuscript hands of the later Middle Ages, and which by the 19th century had become particularly associated with Germanic culture and language. The Nazis eventually decided to dump the fracture typeface in favor of the Roman script, claiming, mendaciously, anti-Semitic reasons, but actually because it made practical sense to use the same typeface as the rest of the Latin alphabet-using world. The Nazis weren't the only ones to favor the fracture typeface. Many writers in the 19th and early 20th century expressed similar attachment to the script for German nationalist reasons, such as German type designer Rudolf Koch. In addition to typefaces, Koch was also interested in other graphic symbols, such as the old Germanic runes, and published a book on various old symbols, monograms, and runes called The Book of Signs. This book brought many of these old symbols and runes to pop culture notice, including to the attention of rock band Led Zeppelin, who used a couple of the symbols from the book on the cover of their fourth album, which were meant to represent the band members. The one that drummer John Bonham selected was three circles, meant to symbolize two parents and a child. It also happens to be similar, though flipped upside down, to the company logo of the 400-year-old German industrial Krupp family dynasty, known for steelworks, and for, believe it or not, a German heavy metal band called Die Krupps, who called themselves after this old German family name. The company logo is actually based on the seamless railway wheels the company manufactured, but, lest you think this is all a bit of a tangential connection, the Krupp family ties into our story in another way. You see, the company manufactured weapons for World War II, for which they got into some trouble due to their forced labor practices, as well as for World War I, during which they built the famous heavy gun called Big Bertha, named after, if you'll believe it, Krupp family member and heiress Bertha Krupp. Actually, there's a long history of giving guns women's names, such as Mons Meg at Edinburgh Castle, and also it seems the very first gun, so to speak. At least that's where the word gun comes from, a particular 14th century canon at Windsor Castle called Domina Gunhilda, or Lady Gunhilda. Gunhilda is an old Scandinavian name, the two parts Gunnar and Hildur both meaning battle, and both names of Valkyries, the warrior goddesses who collect the souls of the slain warriors from the battlefield in Norse mythology. As the Oxford English Dictionary points out, there weren't any notable women in England at the time by that name, so likely the use of the name for large munitions, before gunpowder and cannons, they be ballistas or other large siege weapons, goes back to Scandinavian times. Perhaps after someone like Gunhilda, daughter of Harold Bluetooth. She and her husband were apparently killed in the St. Bryce's Day Massacre in 1002, when all the Danes in England were ordered killed by King Athelred the Unready, in retaliation for which her brother Swain Forkbeard retook England, which Harold Bluetooth had held before Athelred, bringing it back under Scandinavian control. And speaking of Harold Bluetooth, that's where we get the term for the wireless short-range communication technology that you probably have in your smartphone. You see, Harold was also known for uniting the warring Danish tribes into a single unified kingdom. In fact, the Jellings runestone I've used as the background for this video was raised by Harold to commemorate his unification of Denmark and Norway. And on that basis, Swedish telecommunications company Ericsson picked his name for a technology that was intended to unify the, at the time, disorganized communications protocols, uniting them into one standard. Oh, and the symbol for that unifying technology? It's based on the runic symbols for the initials of Harold Bluetooth. So hopefully we'll try and post a few images of some of those runes in our show notes, at least the ones we mentioned specifically, and maybe one overall picture of the whole alphabet, just so you get a sense of what they look like. Because describing letter forms in a podcast <laughs> works great. Yeah, it works better in the video where there's images. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit more about the runes and their development. Mm -hmm. So the runes are an alphabetic writing system, right? like the Latin alphabet that we use in English today. It's known as the Futhark or Futhork. Futhark in other Scandinavian places, Futhork in England because of sound changes that happen. Because the English are weird. Well, because, 
because of a sound change that happened to that particular vowel. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like my explanation better. And the reason it's called the Futhark or Futhork is from the first six characters written in order. Right. So it's like A, B, C, D, E, F. If you write them in order, it spells out the first six characters spells out that word, Futhark. Right. And so that's what they were called. And it's not a word otherwise. It's not a word yeah. otherwise. Yeah. So it's like saying the ABCs or something. Or the alphabet. Or the alphabet. That too. Good point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the alphabet named after alpha beta. Yeah. First two letters of the Greek alphabet. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which will come up in a later episode. Yeah. We'll episode, get to it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll, later today. We're well, later today as well. Yes. Bit, yeah. So the earliest runic inscriptions date from around... 150 CE. Mm -hmm. How much before that they existed is hard to say. Mm -hmm. The earliest complete Futhark, so like the, the, the whole, whole alphabet, alphabet written out, yeah. is from the 4th century. Okay, it's pretty early. Mm -hmm. Now there are several different versions of the Futhark. It sort mm -hmm. of changed over time. And I'm not going to necessarily mention all of them, but I'm going to, I'm going to mention the, the main ones that were used in the early period. There are later sort of medieval runes, so okay. after after the year 1000. So th the earliest Futhark was the Elder Futhark. Mm -hmm. That was used from around 150, or earlier, who knows, to around 800 CE. And these names are later historical names, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Elder is just meaning the older one, the, older. the earlier one. Yeah. Yeah. Now that... Futhark consisted of 24 runes, which were often arranged in three groups of eight. Okay. And from that developed the Old English Futhork, which was used from at least around 400 to 1100 CE. And those were used, as I say, specifically in England. So they represented some of the sound Sounds changes that, that were happened in England. In England. Right. So it's therefore an expanded set of 29 and later 33 runes to account for those phonological changes that happened, including the development of diphthongs. There's, right. there, are, there are a lot of diphthongs in Old English compared to other Germanic languages hmm. at that time anyways. Okay. Um, and so they needed characters for those. Another development from the Elder Futhark is the Younger Futhark. <laughs> Big surprise. That was it's used. The, it's the great creativity good, in naming, naming systems it, yeah. that yeah, it's always impressive about scholars. So that was used from around 800 to around 1100 CE, and it was first attested in Danish inscriptions, and so I guess spread from Denmark to other parts okay. of the Scandinavian world. It is a reduced form of the Elder Futhark. It only has 16 runes, Ooh. which is surprising. You'd think normally letters might be added, mm. but no, this was specifically simplified, I think, mm. is, is the idea. And so Make they're... it easier to learn to read. Right. Yeah, read. exactly. Right. And so certain letters do double duty. So it's a pared down writing system. Now, the largest group of surviving runic inscriptions are in the Younger Futhark, which mm -hmm. I suppose is not surprising. And specifically from the Viking age in Denmark and Sweden on rune stones, which is the thing you would expect to survive. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. There are obviously other artifacts that do have. Yeah. We'll get into that when you do what's the earliest English word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's things like combs. I, mm -hmm. I think I mentioned one in that video mm -hmm. and, you know, other sort of more perishable mm -hmm. materials would be inscribed with runes, but, you know, they, they, don't, don't, they don't tend to survive as much. So there were later runes, as I say, used in Scandinavian places through the later part of the Middle Ages, and even as late as around 1800. Like used for actual communication and record keeping? Or for decorative purposes mm. or for, for various other reasons. I don't okay. know how much. Well, that's what I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. There are runic manuscripts. I don't know if there's any that date that late. But hmm. there are runic manuscripts produced in later periods. Okay. So. Interesting. So exactly where and when the runes were developed and from what earlier alphabet is a matter of much debate. <laughs> there is so much written on this. And most of it is written in Danish. <laughs> <laughs> so how's that a problem, Mark? <laughs> my, my comprehension of Danish is not great. <laughs> I can, I can manage modern Icelandic if I need to, <laughs> Danish is harder. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, so there are a number of competing kind of theories. Some of the older theories about the origins of runes is one, it came from the Latin alphabet. Right. Or two, it came from the Greek alphabet mm -hmm. by the Goths on the north coast of the Black Sea. 
Mm -hmm. but with some Latin letter. There are obviously some letters that aren't Greek, so they must have come from Latin. Okay. Or from Etruscan or other North Italian alphabets. Right. Okay. And in fact, the symbols seem to most closely resemble the North Italian alphabets, though there is no single alphabet that we have that has all of the runic symbols in it. Hmm. That's interesting. So it may just be that it was, it didn't survive or... So we can't pin it down to a specific right, alphabet. Right, right. And there's, there's so much interaction because like when you're talking about Germans, mm -hmm. there are Germans, broadly Germanic speaking, yeah. all along the sort of northern yeah. parts where they could have interacted with any of these groups. They so were used no, in, in mercenary forces in, yeah. for the Romans. So there's no particular, and trade well, and long and, before they were mercenaries, they were, they were fighting them and yeah. trading with them. So yeah. yeah, there's like so many points of possible contact that yeah. you can't really pin it down makes sense but it's generally now accepted to be from an old italic script so i don't think anyone's championing the greek, greek or etruscan hypothesis anymore but of course even there there is you know it, it's uncertain which particular variant mm -hmm. yeah that, that only likely. narrows it down it does not yeah. pin it down yeah so some possible sources include the the Rhytic. These are just all, uh, everything you're going to name is almost certainly just going to be an early group that was yeah. then subsumed by the Romans. By the Romans. <laughs> exactly. So they were in the north of Italy. Yeah. That geographically, I suppose, makes sense. Mm -hmm. The Venetic, who mm -hmm. are from the northeast, that's where modern day Venice is. Mm -hmm. The Etruscans, who, who are in central Italy, so a little further down. Yeah, just north of Rome. Yeah, basically. where modern day Tuscany is. Mm -hmm. Or Old Latin, which obviously is centered on Rome. But of course, later on, as Rome gained control of other parts of the peninsula, the alphabet went with them. Mm -hmm. So depending on when. Yeah, well, uh, exactly when this transition yeah. happens. Yeah. And there are various arguments in favor of each of these options. So you could say, oh, well, this one has so many symbols that correspond or, you know. Right. The shapes of these are the more. Shapes. Yeah. So it's, everyone has their argument, it seems, and. And you're um, in no position I'm to, not gonna. <laughs> to judge between I'm not them. An, yeah. I'm not an expert on this. So the process of transmission is also greatly debated. Mm. The oldest inscriptions we have are in Denmark and Northern Germany, but that may not be where they were first used, right? right. Those are just okay. the early surviving ones. Yeah, of course. So there's a West Germanic hypothesis that suggested it happened in the area around the Elbe River. Mm -hmm. or there's a Gothic hypothesis that it was <laughs> in the East and it happened along with the Eastern Germanic expansion. Mm -hmm. So who knows? But if it's early enough, and it seems to be, I mean, in the, in the first and second century CE, the sort of common Germanic language had not yet branched off into its three right. major branches, East Germanic, West Germanic, and North Germanic. Right. Which is not to say that the languages they Hadn't spoke already. was all uniform, mm -hmm. but they were not so differentiated yet. They were still all... So they may well have been mixing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's even difficult to make that argument on phonological grounds, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're phonologically mm -hmm. all kind of the so same. So there's no easy way to distinguish yeah. them. Yeah. What we can say, interestingly, I suppose, is we can look at the order of the runes in the Futhark. Mm -hmm. So at first glance, you might think, well, Futhark, A, B, C, D, E, F, I mean. F, U, T, H, A, R, K. Yeah. It, it doesn't yeah. look related at all. Yeah. But actually, there is evidence of the relationship between the order in the Futhark and the alphabet. So first of all, the F rune, that first rune, mm -hmm. looks very similar to the A rune. Okay, you're wearing a shirt with runes on it right now. So rather than call up the runes, show, just show me. All right. Rune? When you say looks similar to A, a what rune. you mean by the, oh, the A rune, I was going to say, does not look at all like A. No. Yes, okay. No, the F rune, so yeah, the F rune sort of is angled. It's like the bars on the F are angled upward, whereas the A rune, the bars on the F are angled downward. Exactly. Okay. And so what might have happened is they flipped positions. So it started point. with an A. It started with an A, like the alphabet does. Just not an A that looks like an A. Well, if you consider You can what, make it and, kind of end yeah. up looking like an and A. And if yeah. you look at, at early, early alphabets. italic alphabets, they don't look That's, exactly yeah. like the, the Yeah, Same later. with early Greek ones. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, mm -hmm. so if you flip those two, then Futhark gives you the order A-U-T-H-F-R-K. Still doesn't help, but we've got an A first. <laughs> now, the B rune and the U rune 
may have also exchanged places because this is a phonological thing. So the yeah, the B rune, rune looks like a B. Yes. And the U rune looks like an N with a slanty top. Yeah. Like a they triangular just, N, yeah. but with a, like a, yeah. Now they don't look similar. all that similar, no. but phonologically what may have happened here is that B was more like a W sound. And so B, if you flip those two, because B is more of a B, it's made with the, the lips rounded. Mm -hmm. And so the two sounds are, are phonologically similar. Okay. They may have flipped places in which case you get the B rune as second. Mm. So now we've got A and B. Okay. And it also puts the, the U after T. Right. T U instead of S T B. I'm going to take a picture of this when we're done. <laughs> so I can post your, 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 shirt. your shirt, which you yeah. got in Iceland. That's true. Yep. So it's very exciting. Now, as for the thorn, the third character in the mm -hmm. food arc, well, that phonetically we can say is related to D and in fact, yeah. D and... That one I'll give you. Yeah. You don't have to explain that. Well, I mean, you can explain if you want, but it's... I can, yeah. They're I both that. dental yeah. sounds. They're articulated in D the same the way. And similar. indeed, you know, as I talked about mm -hmm. in, in the video, one D another. with a slash through it made the TH sound mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, so therefore that thorn may have originally represented a D. And so you get that in the, in the next position, mm -hmm. right? Which is where you would expect a D. And it also then, doesn't look all that dissimilar to a D, right? Mm -hmm, like a capital yeah. D, it's just that the the side, the upper up, upright, mm -hmm. go, extends to either side beyond the. Yeah, you could say it looks a bit like a delta in particular yeah. if you think about it that mm -hmm. way. Though I always thought that the thorn rune kind of looked like a thorn, right? That may be a later rationalization. Mm -hmm. Who knows? The E rune, which confusingly looks, looks like, like an, an M, looks M, exactly like an looks M, looks exactly yeah. like an M, is right next to. The M rune, which looks like an M, you, well, see if you can describe yeah, it. Yeah, uh, an M that's wearing a bow tie. So <laughs> the top in, where the, where the, well, the, my hand gestures aren't helping, <laughs> um, where the, the angles, if you think about it, a capital M and how there's an, an angle line, imagine both of the angle lines going from the top all the way to the other upright. Yeah. So, so they, they meet cross and then keep going. And they keep going instead of just making a V in the middle. So and so axe. that's what I mean by the bow tie. You have two mm -hmm. like triangles facing one another with the sides on the other, uprights on the other sides. So that E rune may have been located elsewhere in the order. And then, and then moved there moved because, it because the, the two same. look so similar. So we could then potentially reconstruct <laughs> the position of the E near the beginning of the alphabet mm -hmm. where it ought to be. Then later on in the Footh arc, we have the sequence P Z S T. Yes, right. Now that sort of looks similar to the alphabetic order, right? Except for the one letter in there that sort of breaks the order. So that Z looks out of place though. Where did mm -hmm. that Z come from? There was another sound change that happened in early Germanic in which the Z became, the Z sound that is to say, became an R sound which eventually led to there being two R's. So in later Footh arcs, there are two characters that make the R sound. Though in transcription, they followed the usual practice of transcribing one of them as a capital R and the other one as a lowercase R, just because to, to represent the yeah. fact that they came from two different sources. They're originally two different sounds. Okay. So if you do that though, if that Z turns to an R, then suddenly we have P-R-S-T. Yeah, okay. So, I feel like the amount of special <laughs> pleading going on here, because each one of these is like a different mechanism, right? Yeah, like yeah. that's, that's the problem behind that all is of this. Maybe the problem behind this. Yeah. But in any case, it gives us an order that looks a lot more like alphabetical order. If we adjust all of those, mm -hmm. we get A, B, D, E, F, and then that other R, and then the K, C. Right. Which is really from a Kappa, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then later on, P, R, S, T, U. So that's the argument. <laughs> but none of that helps you narrow down which Italic script it comes from, though. Well, it seems it? to be similar to Western Greek and Old Italic. So that's, you know, pretty much all we can say for certain. And actually, most of that was not kind of certain not in the slightest. Certain. <laughs> what I can say with somewhat more certainty is <laughs> the geographic spread of runic inscriptions. Okay. So the farthest north and the farthest west is the try and pronounce this because it's a sort of Greenlandic word. King it tor suak. Mm. King it tor suak runestone. <laughs> okay. I'm going to guess that's in Greenland. In from Greenland. What you said. <laughs> yep. And by the way, before anyone writes in, no, the furthest west is not the Kensington runestone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. That's the one in like Minnesota or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not real. It's a hoax. 
Sorry. Right. So yeah, so Greenland, the farthest, both the farthest north and the farthest west. Okay. And that inscription says something along the lines of, well, I won't try reading it out in Norse because <laughs> I'll probably butcher it at this point. I'm really out of practice. But it says, Erlinger, the son of Sigvaths and Barne Thor Thordarson, Thordar Thordar's son, <laughs> and Enri the Aus son, Washing Day, which is my favorite. Yeah, Saturday. Yeah. Sa Saturday is my favorite day of the week in, in Norse. Washing Day, before Rogation Day, raised this mound and rode, and then you can't read the rest. Road, R-O-D-E? R-O-D-E. Okay. When you're talking about Road Scandinavian people, it could be the R O W E D. Yes, right. right? <laughs> All right. So it's a marker stone or a monument stone, yeah. and it's within the Christian period. Yes, because they mentioned Rogation Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The farthest east is the Berezan rune stone, which was found on Berezan Island, which is on the Black Sea. Okay. And it says, Granny made this vault in memory of Carl, his partner. Granny is not like grandmother. Yeah, I was it's, totally it's thinking it was. was <laughs> G-R-A-N-I. Like, what an odd thing to write. <laughs> not even grandmother, but just yeah. granny. G-R-A-N-I. Okay. Yes. It's a vault, like a tomb, basically. I guess, yeah. Probably, yeah. And just looking at it now, the, the word for partner is falaga, which is fellow, literally. Fellow, right. fellow. Right. The furthest south is the inscription on a marble lion from Athens. Ah, uh, yes. The Pariah's I know about lion. This one. Which is now no longer in Athens. It's on display in Venice because of Romans, I guess. <laughs> right. Well, at least it's Romans, not English. I <laughs> yes. thought you were going to say the British Museum, but no, yes. No, no, it's in Venice. So this is presumably pilfered a long time ago. And it says something along the lines of, they cut him down in the midst of his forces, but in the harbor, the men cut runes by the sea in memory of Horsey, a good warrior. <laughs> That's his name, Horsey, though mm -hmm. it probably does mean horse. The Swedes set this on the lion. So, you right. know, it's Swedes who did it, I guess. He went his way with good counsel, gold he won in his travels. The warrior cut names, hewed them in an ornamental scroll. Askel, or Auskel, Iskel, depending on how you read it, and others. So this is probably something that doesn't show. And Thorleifer had them well cut. They who lived in Roslagen, and then there are two bits that, that aren't represented, but they seem to follow the formula of name, name. Mm -hmm. So name, name, son of, name, name, cut these runes. Ulver and name, name, colored them in memory of Horsey. He won gold in his travels. That's a long inscription. Yeah. Huh. To put on something that wasn't purpose made for it. That's long graffiti <laughs> is really what I'm trying to say. Especially given how much of it is just saying, I wrote this. Yes. Well, that's what a lot, most of the runic inscriptions basically say that. And this is the best example of this. So this mm. is the next one. There's, there's also a runic inscription in Constantinople. Right. Which is also fairly famous. Isn't this the one that yes. Adam Lang talks about? Yeah. 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 So it's in the Hagia Sophia or Hagia Sophia, depending uh, how you pronounce yeah. it. There are in fact two inscriptions that have been found and it's speculated that there actually may be more that ha just haven't been discovered yet. Oh, okay. But they don't, they haven't fared as well. So they're not easily legible. One of them probably said, the, the only thing that can be read at this point, I, I think, is four letters, F-D-A-N, but it probably said Halfdan. Okay. And the rest is not legible, but it's speculated to mean something like Halfdan carved these runes. So literally, they traveled all that way to Constantinople, <laughs> went into like, a church, and graffitied it with, Kilroy was here. <laughs> I think a church is an understatement for a Hagia Sophia, yeah. but... <laughs> There's another one that is also pretty much illegible, but may have said something like Ari made or Ari made the runes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think they had, there's like one letter there that they can maybe read. And right. <laughs> and then they've guessed the rest guess, of it. Yeah. But mostly because that's clearly what everybody just went around doing yeah. is writing I was here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, apparently there's a lot of that going on in the ISV. And the, the other interesting thing about the geographical spread of, of runic inscriptions is that though runes are mentioned frequently in the sagas, Iceland has the fewest inscriptions of hmm. all the Scandinavian Even though they countries. talk about it all the time. Yeah. So not that many in Iceland. But, you know, kind of the interesting point 
to take away from that is that the mention of the runes in Iceland are the ones that seem to describe mostly the magical mm, use of right, runes. Right. And so that brings me to my next topic, runes and magic. Mm -hmm. So the connection between the runes and magic is much debated. <laughs> Another very uh, securely discussed yeah, I know. thing. Ru runology is all like crazy. All made up stuff. <laughs> it's what you're saying. Yeah. It's all made wild up. There is no of, truth. <laughs> there is, is, it's this crazy wild west of Scholarship. scholarly debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, there was, I think, some famous quote that, you know, there are as many interpretations of a runic inscription as there are runologists who <laughs> looked at it. Look at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really what it's like. And, and, you know, to be a runologist, you have to either be, you know, really credulous or really skeptical. <laughs> right. To be able to make an argument of any sort. Of any yeah. sort. Yeah. You can just say, ah, it probably means nothing. Or you, you get two letters and somehow reproduce a long Dissertation, poem out of it. Yeah. I don't know. But the question is, are runes magical in and of themselves, or are they just a script? A way of writing a spell. Which could be used for magical purposes, right? right? We don't think of the Latin alphabet as magical, but it was used in, right. in spells. Except for when we have the abracadabra, but... Yes, right. But that's not quite just the alphabet. It's still magical words. Yeah. And so it's really hard to judge, and it's also just because it's you know, maybe quite likely used for magic in one place doesn't mean that it was used for that in another place. Mm -hmm. So you can't mm -hmm. assume consistency over the entire Germanic regions. Right. One way of thinking of, I mean, you can look at the, the objects themselves and make judgments about what the object is. And is it likely to be something that was used for a magical purpose? You know, mm -hmm. is it an amulet for protection, but how do you know, or yeah. is it just written on a comb? That's not going to be magical presumably you there's also sort of arguments you can make by looking at the inscriptions themselves what they're written on mm -hmm. how they might be used but the other way of thinking about this is of course the semantics of the word rune itself which is what i talked about in that video so to just expand on that a little bit the gothic word runa glosses greek mysterion and occasionally boule which means council mm -hmm. and they're commonly used these because our Gothic stuff is all Christian, biblical translation. So they're used to refer to the divine mysteries. Okay. So, which means sort of hidden things of great, not, you know, that, that you have mm -hmm. to have special knowledge to know, which would definitely parallel the idea of magic. But on the other hand, literacy is in itself a mystery. I mean, in none of these periods were people like massively literate mm -hmm. at all levels, right? So writing is a mystery, and, and, the, and that doesn't have to make it magical. Mm -hmm. It just is, can be a good parallel. So, But of course, the, the New Testament really has this, the, what is it? It's the famous quote. There's a few famous quotes from the New Testament. New Testament so I you're know. not really Logos, pinning it down. The Logos one. The uh, word in the beginning was the word and the word the was word. with God. Yeah. So the word itself has a kind of, yeah. and, and that's true of all the, the way that the religions of the book kind function, of do yeah. function yeah. is that there is something sacred about Words. Words, right? Some Which words, all words, something Bi about Bibles words in themselves, themselves yeah. are sacred or holy. They have this sort of power. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Who knows? But that's one bit of evidence okay. there. Okay. There's also another word, uh, Gothic word, garuni, which is just runi with the, the ga prefix or the g prefix that you find in all the Germanic languages, mm -hmm. which means, is used to mean consultation or counsel, perhaps with the idea of secrecy. Okay. In Old High German, you get the same two words, basically runa and giruni, with similar meanings. Mm -hmm. In Old Norse, the plural form runar is sometimes used to mean secret lore or mysteries, and there are related verb forms to it that mean whisper. Okay. Old Irish has a cognate, and that's this is the only seeming co cognate for this. Old Irish. Now that's not Germanic. Yeah, I right. know. Yeah. Okay. So this is the only seeming cognate outside of the Germanic languages. Right. Rune, which means secret. There's also a Finnish word, runo, which is probably an early borrowing from Germanic. Right. Uh, yeah, never like to Finnish for your And it support. means song and perhaps originally incantation. Right. So it goes from incantation to but, song. But I mean, that is that is an absolutely standard Indo-European. I right. know Finns aren't Indo-European, but right. Song and spell are the same yeah. word in lots of languages. So the sense, if looking at all this data, the sense shift may have kind of gone in this way from originally secret to secret meeting, to whisper, to secret formula, 
to incantation, to charm, and then by way of the tradition of Germanic lot casting, in which runes seem to have been used, cryptic symbol and rune. Okay. So it originally just meant secret, not referring to the writing specifically. Uh, right. And then that became used to refer to the writing because, because writing, writing is, is secret. secret. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now I say, I mentioned the, the Germanic lot casting that seems to have been used. Yeah. Runes. And so again, this is one of these arguments that's based on kind of mm, slim evidence, but, mm -hmm. or, or questionable evidence anyways. But there is, of course, an account of early Germanic peoples by the Roman author Tacitus. Of course, we don't have, since they were only writing inscriptions and not long Yeah, text, so we don't have... We don't have a lot of textual evidence about Germanic people until much later, until after they were Christianized, generally. But we do have this account written by Tacitus, and he writes in his Germania, which is his ethnographic work on mm -hmm. the Germanic people. At one point he writes, Augury and divination by lot no people practice more diligently. The use of the lots is simple. A little bough is lopped off a fruit-bearing tree and cut into small pieces. These are distinguished by certain marks. Mm -hmm. Nota is the word he uses. Right. And thrown carelessly and at random over a white garment. In public questions, the priest of the particular state, in private, the father of the family, invokes the gods and with his eyes toward, towards heaven, takes up each piece three times and finds in them a meaning according to the mark previously impressed on them. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know that these are runes. We don't know that it's even writing. It could mm -hmm. just be symbols. Or it could be like slashes for numbers, right? Yeah, I mean, it could be anything. But some have argued that this is an account of the using of runes in the casting of lots, mm -hmm. magical purpose, and suggesting. But that oh, still doesn't mean that runes are in the in and of themselves magical. No, I suppose because, it doesn't. Because yeah. I mean, if you put letters, like tarot cards, have letters mm -hmm. on them, but yep. letters are still not magical. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So of course, as I say, we don't know whether or not this means that runes were magical at all places. Mm -hmm. Certainly the evidence of the Icelandic sagas suggests that there they thought of them in magical right. ways. But so that leaves the question, were runes magical in England? And the evidence of magical runes in England is very slight. Basically there's two okay. possible references and they're both about the same story, one taken from the other. So Bede tells this story of a young man named Imma who had been taken prisoner but could not be fettered because the fetters became miraculously loosened every time they, I think it was every time they celebrated the mass. Okay. They, they'd just pop off. Because he was so holy. Yeah. But they, his, his captors thought it might be magic and they asked him, quote, whether he knew the releasing rune and had about him the staves written out. So in Latin, that would be quare ligare non posset on forte literas solutoris, solutorius, mm -hmm. the words in the Old English translation of Bede is alessendlican runa, so loosening rune, it seems to me, mm -hmm. though mm -hmm. there's some textual debate about this. There are different readings in different manuscripts, okay. so yeah. this is only in one manuscript, I think. And the other word, stavas, staves, literally, if he had them written, the staves written. So stave is, is used in, or staff, is used in Old English to mean letter, mm -hmm. like you could refer to a right. Latin letter as right. much as anything else. Right. So it is definitely a word, a, you know, a word used to refer to individual letters. And then Alfrich later on refers to this passage from Bede and he uses it in one of his homilies. And his version of the same story is that they ask him whether he broke his bonds asunder by means of sorcery of rune staves. Mm. Uh, and the, the word there is literally rune stavum, rune right. staves. Right. So this sort of implies maybe something magical. Yeah. Yeah, but again, it doesn't imply necessarily that the runes, the runes themselves, themselves are magical, are magical. but it, meh, that's closer though. I, yeah. that, that seems more convincing that, to me. But that's it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. all of them, that's, that's what you're basing your whole argument right. there for, for England. Right. So who knows? And since I'm talking about runes, I want to mention my favorite runic inscription, which is actually the most numerous inscription. I remember this one. <laughs> written in the Elder Futhark from the third to eighth centuries. And even occasionally in England, not as often, not nearly as often, but mm -hmm. very common outside of England, it's the most common, as I say, of early runic charm words. It's the word alu, mm -hmm. which 
on the face of it looks like the word ale. Right. Now, the origin and meaning of this, of course, is highly disputed, yet again. It, it's generally taken as some kind of runic magic, but is it the word ale? Is it some other meaning? It, it's really hard to say, because usually it's just Why written, bother just have that, like, why? Yeah, it's just that one word. Why right? would you? How can you tell? <laughs> and But also, why would you, if it does mean ale, why would you? Right, ale on an amulet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who knows? So it may be ale in the sense of an intoxicating beverage, which sort of seems magical, the idea of intoxication. Mm -hmm. Though other meanings have been suggested, like it might mean amulet, and there's a word that's close enough to it that might be that, or protect. But again, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So it's been posited that it might come from a proposed Indo-European root, alu, which might mean, or the, the sort of definition for this, according to Cal Watkins, is in words related to sorcery, magic, possession, and intoxication. Mm -hmm. Or, according to Pokorny, the Pokorny Dictionary, mm -hmm. bitter or beer. And so this bitter sense might be related, therefore, to alum in Latin, alum, and therefore also aluminum. Right. So the b bitterness might be the, right. the ultimate sense. Again, I don't know why that would, that would be, uh, yeah. make sense. I mean, medicinal, things that are bitter often medicinal, but that doesn't make mm -hmm. sense for why you'd inscribe it places. That might make sense for beer, I suppose. Anyways, the other interesting point of that, though, is that in Beowulf, there is a passage in which grief or terror is described with the word ealu shawen, which means pouring out of ale or at least it seems to mean that literally it's okay. kind of hard to interpret, but so it has some kind of force, right? Right. Some sort of meaning beyond. Some sort of metaphorical or emotional yeah. force. Yeah. And of course, just because I like this uh, etymology, the word bridal also comes from the word ale. They are specifically in its bridal, beer sense. B-R-I-D-A-L. D-A-L. To yeah. do with brides. To do with brides. like a Not bridal as in a horse. No, it's not bridal as in a horse. It's literally from bride plus ale. And in Old English, it meant wedding feast, so ale in the sense of the feast. Now, the etymology of bride, by the way, is uncertain. There is a Gothic cognate, bruths, which means daughter-in-law. But that actually kind of makes sense because the newly married person, the newly married woman in any household is going to be the daughter-in-law, if you look at it from a certain perspective, right? Yeah. And so therefore, that bride part might be connected with... The, we don't know where that where that comes from, as I said, but it might be connected through this logic to the Proto-Indo-European root breu, which means to boil, bubble, effervesce, burn, with derivatives referring to cooking and brewing, as it would be the daughter-in-law's job to do the cooking and brewing. Mm -hmm. So it could mean beer beer, therefore. <laughs> right. right. Pride and ale. Bridal means beer beer. <laughs> or beer ale. <laughs> Anyways, I kind of like that. Nice. Yeah. Now I just have a couple of last little tiny things to mention that aren't specifically, well, actually just one last thing to mention that isn't specifically runes, but it is another early Germanic writing system. Mm -hmm. And that's the Gothic alphabet. So I mentioned the Gothic language and, you know, we have and the this, yeah, you talked about and a few words from Gothic. And as I say, this was basically used by, probably invented by Bishop Wolfila, who was, you know, a bishop and missionary mm -hmm. to convert the, the Goths to Christianity. And so he used them in his biblical translations produced mm -hmm. in the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And it was believed that Wolfila consciously chose not to use the runic alphabet okay. for translating the Bible into Gothic because of their association with pagan and right. natural, you know, uh, magic things and so forth. So the letters themselves, therefore, are mostly directly from the Greek alphabet. They're pretty recognizable as, yeah. as kind of yeah. Greek. With a few extra letters to represent sounds isn't, that Greek it, didn't have, isn't specifically F and G, which were clearly taken from the Latin alphabet. Right. And there is possibly a runic character to represent, to distinguish between the consonant W, W sound, and the vowel U, rather than using U for both. Mm -hmm. That may have been based on a rune, but it's not clear. So okay. that's speculation. It's not certain where it comes from, but that's one possibility. So a small runic connection there, but it's just interesting that there was this whole writing system invented mm. for a Germanic language that, that consciously avoided, early, that mm. consciously avoided runes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a lot, actually. You'd said you didn't have very much to talk about, <laughs> but that was actually a lot. So I might kind of, okay, I'm going to cut out some of what I was going to talk about. However, 
if you've made it this far into the podcast, dear Wombat, <laughs> our good friend, Michael, just earlier today happened to tweet, I wonder where the alphabet order comes from. You know, is it just random or where does it come from? And I don't want to go into too much detail about alphabets because we will get to that when we get to spelling. So we pointed him to our spelling video. And that will become a podcast. That will become a podcast, but not yet. Not yet. So I promised that we'd talk a little bit about it on our podcast. And then I do have a couple of other little things I want to talk about. Because we talked about the food arc order, mm -hmm. right? And then all of that and how it's connected to the alphabet order. So very briefly, I want to talk a little bit about the Greek alphabet, right. the early Greek alphabet, because it influenced the Latin. You know, when you talk about the Italic al alphabet as opposed to the Greek Yes, but of course the Italic alphabet is derived from the Greek, Greek. alphabet. All of the alphabets in Europe yeah. are, including the runic alphabet, are derived eventually from the Greek alphabet. But it they didn't have itself, it <laughs> So yeah, but it itself, of course, is derived from a Phoenician mm -hmm. alphabet, which, as you talk about in spelling, is itself derived from an Egyptian, not alphabet, but from Egyptian hieroglyphic writing. Well, before that, there was another group of Semitic people yes. who weren't the Phoenicians, but it was a language fairly close to Phoenician. Right. So another Semitic people who took were, the were, hieroglyphs. Yeah. Some of whom were in Egypt, mm -hmm. who worked as miners, apparently. And that's where we first see it attested. Right. So if we're talking about where the order is, this is something we should look up for the, when we do talk about yeah. spelling is we should look more into the order because I don't think you went into why it is the order why, it is. Yeah. And I'm not sure there is an answer to that. But what is something that I will say is, so what happens is the Semitic alphabet draws on Egyptian hieroglyphs and basically does this thing of whatever the word the hieroglyph represents, it takes the first letter yeah. and makes that symbol now stand for just that letter and that's how it becomes alphabetic and it was already being done that way in, in egyptian, egyptian right. to write out names specifically right right and so that they sort of extend that practice to mm -hmm. all writing then that by the time it cuts to phoenician uh, and it all through the semitic alphabets they're not really alphabets they're abjads they they only have consonants yeah they don't write out the vowels because the rules of semitic languages make vowels I don't really know the details, but moderately predictable, I think. It's sort of the basic, right? Yeah. Well, what, what happens is you change the vowels to change something grammatically about the word. Yeah, you'd still so you can think have the same root. I know. You'd still think consonants. you'd want to write that out. I still, I find it baffling, but I've never taken a Semitic language like, yes. And that's why we write down ED on the end of our verbs right. so that we can tell it's in the past tense. How right. do you read a sentence if you don't know what tense it? Anyway, obviously I need to learn, you know. This is still how Arabic is written and and Hebrew and stuff. So yeah. like clearly people can make it work because well, they do. Now they use uh, they use points and stuff, but you don't need to. No. For generations and millennia, yeah, they, they didn't. Make it so. easier. Yeah. Anyway, the point being that Semitic didn't have signs for vowels. Mm -hmm. So when Greek, so just moving on to what I know a little more about, which is how the Greek alphabet moves we don't know the details and there is this is disputed too you know how did it get from it clearly got from phoenicia to greece that's undisputed but when and how mm -hmm. no no we Some, know the phoenicians were oh there's no not a, it's not hard so to understand contact there, we know there's lots of contact but like what exactly when, where yeah. when in what particular like why was it first taken over what was the first purpose of it right our best guess right now seems to be sometime in the 800s BC. Okay. Okay. And probably in like Cyprus or Crete or in Asia Minor, just because of those big trading hubs. Right. But that's not because we know of it. I mean, it people make different arguments. Sense, it makes yeah. logical sense. The Greeks themselves knew it was Phoenician. They re reference it. So Herodotus, for instance, says that he gives us the story of Cadmus and this comes elsewhere too. I'll get back to that. But the term Phoenikeia, which means Phoenician things, right. is used for letters in early Greek writing oh. and in inscriptions. And archaic Crete has an inscription that has Poinikastas to mean scribe and yeah. Poinikadzane to write. So to do Phoenician things means to write. Mm. So, you know, they very clearly saw it as and knew it as Phoenician in their earliest right. in, incorporations of it into Greek. The big thing that, so to get back to the order of the alphabet thing here, mm -hmm. the big thing is, as you know, I mean, this is, I'm mm -hmm. not telling you anything you don't know, <laughs> you, but that the Greek language did want to represent vowels 
And so they took, they repurposed a bunch of consonants they didn't have. Yeah, fortunately, Phoenician had more consonantal sounds. Had a whole sounds. bunch of, of, you know, very similar consonants that were distinctions that Greek didn't make. So there was a whole bunch of different versions of the K sound. Yeah, for instance. Uh, so they were able to use so there were a number of signs that mm -hmm. made sounds that weren't different from another sound from a, for Greek mm -hmm. purposes. And so they used those and they just turned them into vowels. Yeah. Often from the name, mm -hmm. again, from the first letter that had been or first, you know, one of the sounds, and then sometimes just some seemingly randomly. This is one of the questions is like, was there only one or were there many adoptions? And mm. it really seems to have been one, mm. like one person or group did this and it spread because while there's a, a few variations in early alphabets in Greece, not very many. That's and in particular, the vowel, yeah. which vowels got adopted? doesn't seem to have variations. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's what where you would expect. Yeah, and that's because those are the ones whereas there's a couple of consonants that sort of seem to switch okay. around a little bit like some a psi and a xi I think sort of alternate in a couple of early scripts. But but the vowels don't. So that really does suggest that it was one borrowing mm. because those those are fairly not completely arbitrary but somewhat arbitrary. So the order stuck to the semitic order pretty mm -hmm. much. What happens then is the Greek some of the repurposed consonants, though, get stuck on the end. So there, some of it's not arbitrary in the sense that they put new invented letters onto on the, the end. end. They didn't yeah. stick them in they the middle. They didn't want to break up the already existing yeah, order. Yeah, so there was an order, clearly, and mm -hmm. why there was that order and why this, you know, so the earliest evidence we have for that order, I think, is Semitic, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. So, you know, that is that is still a question. But so there is some reasoning to the order at that stage. Mm -hmm. That's really all I wanted to say for to try to answer Michael's question. Okay. I mean, that's not a full answer at all. Yeah, I think we'd have to look to Egyptian. Really yeah, to, to really see. try to understand. But I mean, because they didn't have an alphabet, I don't know that like, was there an order to, you wouldn't have had an order to the hieroglyphs well, in the same way. You, you didn't use just any hieroglyph to do. To yeah, do that. I know. There but were certain ones that were used. And I don't know if they were ever written out as a set. Well, that's what but I. But they were certainly considered as a set. Yeah. So maybe we'd have to look for that. So maybe we'll have to, we'll look into that. Mm hmm. So I mentioned Cadmus, and just to touch on that, there's this myth. So, it, you know, the Greeks were well aware there was a time before they had writing and then the time after they had writing. Mm -hmm. So the myth is that Cadmus, who's the founder of Thebes, mm -hmm. was an exile from Phoenicia. He's the brother of Europa, the girl who was abducted by Zeus in the shape of a bull mm -hmm. and carried from Phoenicia to Europe, giving her name to Europe. And her brothers were sent out by their father to find her and told not to come back if they didn't. And they didn't because like Zeus. So Cadmus couldn't go back. So he ends up going to the Oracle at Delphi and asking what to do. And they're like, go found a city where a heifer lies down to drink. Anyway, doesn't matter. The point is he found Thebes and he is said to have been the inventor of the alphabet or to have brought the alphabet from Phoenicia. Now there's other versions of it where it's Prometheus oh, because he's, he's the giver of, he's technology. the giver of technology. So mm -hmm. there are other stories in which it's Prometheus, but that's just clearly like he gives all of the important technologies. Yeah. But the one that links it to Cadmus is, is not because Thebes was the early literate city. Right. It's because he's Phoenician and all the stories make him Phoenician. Right. And so they, because they know they it comes from Phoenician, Phoenicia. So yeah. that must've been that. So that's the alphabet in Greece. The argument about why they started using it is interesting because like why decide to start writing things down? Mm -hmm. Not everybody is in that time. And there are two competing arguments and there's good evidence on both sides, but I don't know that we'll ever know. One argument is that it was specifically picked up in order to write epic poetry. Really? Yeah. Remember writing was used for that cuneiform more mm -hmm. in the cultures that the Greeks yep. knew and that they were definitely influenced by. So they were influenced by Sumerian and, and Mesopotamian cultures right. for their myths. We can tell that. So they would have had experience at some point of this idea of writing long epic poems, mm. writing them down. Now, I don't know that the Semitic language was being used for those purposes at the time, but knowing there was a way of writing, mm. that this, this was a way of recording poetry, and then finding an alphabet that seemed better and e way easier than yes. cuneiform yeah. and more easily adapted to Greek, that that might have been why. I would have thought it was like trade. Well, so that's obviously the other argument mm. is that it was first adopted for commercial purposes. Mm. And the you know good evidence for that is that the people they were adopting it from are their trading partners. Yeah. And presumably they were using it for 
commercial purposes, the Phoenicians, that is. Yeah. The thing is that all of our early writing is not commercial. Hmm. Well, but of course, you, why would it survive, yeah. if right? It's, if it's like a list of the cargo yeah. on a ship, who would say that? So that's the... So that's the argument that that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. the counter argument is that, well, what, why would that survive? That's mm -hmm. going to be written in perishable materials. What survives is stuff that's, but what's survives. Well, more importantly, why would you recopy it? Right. Oh, no, but like none of this, none of the of, early of stuff. Epic is yeah. not the original none, copies. No, no, no. But none of, none of what I'm talking about is stuff that was recopied. We're talking about inscriptions. What are the earliest inscriptions? Oh, okay. Right. Like the early actual writing. So the extant writing we have from the eighth century and the seventh century is all popular that is like not elite. It's hmm. sort of like, I mean, probably to some extent elite, but not just for like not royal letters, right? right? Not like, because that's what, of course, cuneiform is special because it, its main medium was clay tablets, which then survive. Yeah. So you, that's why we have so much of it. But all of the extent writing is private and it's not commercial or administrative. We don't have administrative examples of inscriptions until into the sixth century, seventh century. And it's not monumental. No, and it's not monumental. The first known, one of the first known inscriptions, one of the earliest, not the earliest, mm. but one of the earliest inscriptions we have, and a lot of the ones that we have that are early are in hexameter. So oh. they're in verse. Okay. Even if they're not, they're not epic, like what we, mm -hmm. we don't have inscriptions on stone of epic or anything right. like that. But like, even if they're two line or four line poems, they're in hexameter, which is the meter of the early epics of early poetry. So like we have poetic scraps, but we don't have any admin scraps. Mm. These are arguments from slight evidence, yeah. and there's lots of ways you can poke holes in them, but it's interesting. So one of the earliest inscriptions we have is actually on a cup. So it's scratched into and baked into a, a pottery cup. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of a problem with one rather important part of the first line, mm -hmm. but I'm going to read the generally accepted restoration, okay. and I'll talk about what it is. It's from the late 8th century, so you know, 780s or something like that. Th that's BCE. For... BCE, yep. And it's from the Bay of Naples. So that's oh, in Italy, right? Right. So when we're talking about, like, that's how far, far and fast the alphabet spread. Because we're saying that it's the 8th century is when it's yeah. the first inscriptions we have, the first evidence we have of it is in the mid-8th century. And by the late 8th century, it's in southern Italy. Yeah. It, it, which is, of course, a very important Greek area. It, it, that just makes me think... I. I don't think I, I was previously aware of how early yeah. there were Greek settlements in Italy. Yeah, it's in the the eighth century is a big period of colonization, mm. eighth and seventh, but especially the eighth. And so a lot of the southern Italian cities were founded then, and even mm. Marseille and and Sicily. Like Sicily mm. was a huge Greek area from the eighth century onward. So, yeah, it's it's one thinks about those as you know Roman, but no, they're very big Greek areas. So the inscription reads. I am the cup of Nestor, good for drinking. Whoever drinks from this cup, desire for beautifully crowned Aphrodite will seize him instantly. So is this Sex. the Nestor? Well, isn't that an interesting <laughs> question? So it's in hexameters. Uh -huh. So it's in epic meter. Mm -hmm. And Nestor, of course, is a famous name from the Iliad. Mm -hmm. And the problem is one of the, the bits that's least clear is the part where it says, I am there's right. a few possible readings there. Now, the I am is reasonably secure because there's a lot of items in the Greek world that have that, that speak like that, that yeah. say, I am made by so-and-so. I that's am. What, that's what runic inscriptions yeah. very often do. Yeah. So it would be very common for it to say, I am the cup of Nestor. Mm -hmm. But does it mean it was made by Nestor? Does it mean it's owned by Nestor? Is this just a guy named Nestor? But it seems so hard to be. Yeah, exactly. But sort of like, but. This is like in hexameters. Lots and lots have been written on this. I read one article that was interesting, and I'll link in the show notes, that suggested that it has magical properties mm. to it, actually. Well, it seems to be an aphrodisiac, I guess. Well, so this is it. So a lot of people have just said all it's saying is if you drink wine from this cup, because obviously that's what mm -hmm. it's made for, uh, you'll want sex. Yeah. Because wine is an intoxicant and makes you want to have sex. Right. This was actually arguing that it's a little more direct than that. It's saying this cup is magical specifically. And it was arguing from the sort of syntax of sort of conditional curses, which are quite standard. If someone steals this, he will be struck blind, right? right? Like that, whoever steals this, he will be struck blind. Whoever disturbs this stone, let him be cursed by so Zeus. whoever drinks from this cup. Cup, he will be seized. Yeah, so that he, so the argument was really from that. And it was also arguing, quite rightly, that saying you're going to be 
seized by Aphrodite mm -hmm. is not a promise, it's a threat. Yeah. The Greeks and the Romans thought of sort of lust as being kind of a, a madness, a, a pain and a madness that would drive you out of your wits. So like we might think of it as like, haha, an aphrodisiac, but it could also be taken as, or possibly as a joking curse, but still as sort of like a careful what you do with me, I might drive you to lust. It's sort of like Paris and Helen in the Iliad. Oh yeah. Well, uh, think about love stories in Greek myth yeah. and find me one in which the love does something good to the people in love and get back to me on that yeah, one. I mean, Helen's always talking about how she despises. Yeah. <laughs> Aphrodite the, keeps making her. Love of, of the kind that Aphrodite inspires mm -hmm. as opposed to like marital love or family love. It, it's a destructive force. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting. So that's like one of our earliest inscriptions mm. in the Greek alphabet is that cup. So you can see why people have made the argument that it doesn't feel like they learned this special new skill so that they could like keep accounts. Right. But all of the caveats apply. Okay, a couple of things. Of course, the alphabet's not the first way that Greek is recorded. The first one we know is recording Greek is linear B. So the earliest texts that we have recorded in the geographical area known as Greece are in uh, a family of scripts in Crete. Mm -hmm. They've been labeled by Sir Arthur Evans, Cretan pictographic, Cretan hieroglyphic, linear A, and linear B. Now, the first three of those are undeciphered, and it's unclear what language they represent. They probably don't represent Greek because we don't think that the Minoans were a Greek people. Right. But we don't know. So those exist, but we do know Linear B. Mm -hmm. So Linear B was undeciphered until the 20th century, but Michael Ventris, who was building on work by the classicist Alice Kober, who never gets credit, so I'm just going to make sure she does now, and using tablets that had been discovered by Sir Arthur Evans, and then also, importantly, another cache that had been discovered by another archaeologist, Carl Blagan, and photographed, and he was working with the photographs, by Alice in France. He, in 1952, Michael Ventris managed to decipher Linear B for the first time. Right. Uh, using sort of code-breaking techniques, but also building, as I said, on Alice Kober had done the very important work of sort of suggesting this was syllabic, what well, parts that were syllabic and parts that were alphabetic and like okay. it was it's mostly syllabic anyway. And she'd done work on figuring out that there were inflections. Right. And so once like that helped a lot and then he built this sort of like table of inflections and figured stuff out and started to do it and finally did manage to decipher it. And when he deciphered it, he proved that the language it represented was early Greek, right? which was a huge deal because nobody had thought that the Minoans were Greek. We've gone on to feel like that they weren't, and this was Mycenaean influence on late Minoan culture. Mm -hmm. So we have Linear B, and that is an, a syllabic rather than alphabetic. It's, well, it's, it's sort of a bunch of things. It has numerals. Mm -hmm. It has hieroglyphic or pictographic elements, so like things that represent things, right. sort of simplified versions of cows and sheaves of wheat and stuff like that. And then it has the syllabic stuff. Yeah, and that's not unprecedented. Mm -hmm. You know, the Chinese script mixes. Yeah, it makes sense. Like some things are easily represented by pictographs. Yeah. Why wouldn't you represent them by pictographs? Especially because, so in contrast to early Greek alphabet, linear B, what we have, mm -hmm. now of course what we have is stuff that was inscribed on clay that was accidentally preserved when things burned down. Right. So... What we have is probably the stuff that was not meant to last, right. but happened to last. And the stuff that probably was meant to last, if it was written on things like papyrus, mm -hmm. doesn't survive. So we don't know that Linear B wasn't used for other purposes, but we don't have any inscriptions or monumental inscriptions like we do for cuneiform or for, you know, other things. All we have is the Linear B tablets are all administrative. Okay. So it's inventories, it's lists of taxes, it's lists of expenditures by temples. It's all which bureaucratic. Which is why we've got all those numbers. <laughs> which is why we have numbers and why we have lists, you know, right. these images. So like, yeah, if you're going to tally up a whole bunch of cows and jars of wine and all the rest of it, pictographs are perfectly good for that. You don't yeah. need anything else for it. And then the words that are more complicated, they develop a syllabary for it. But that was part of what made it hard to figure out what language it represented. And that's why like the pictographs and hieroglyphics, we don't know what language it represents because we don't have any sound. Right. So the syllabary was the important, figuring out that part of it was a syllabary was really important. And then being able to assign sounds to that and figure out how it worked was the key. Right. 
So anyway, but that writing system seems to have disappeared around 1100 BCE, or by the, certainly by the turn of the millennium, was gone. And when they started writing again. Now that was the, that's the Bronze Age collapse? Yeah. 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 So that was the Mycenaean peoples in Greece who were writing with that. And then, yes, there's this somewhat mysterious, catastrophic collapse of civilizations right. uh, around the Mediterranean. Anyway, there's so much argument about that. I'm not going to start talking sea about peoples. that. Sea peoples. Well, but if it even <laughs> happened, anyway, <laughs> let's not get into that. So that technology was lost. Right. And when they come back to it, A, they come from a totally different direction. They go with an alphabet mm -hmm. from Phoenicia. And B, potentially anyway, they use it for a completely different purpose. Right. So its its role in the civilization is not the same. Right. Too. So that's the earliest scripts. And then the last thing I'll talk very briefly about is our earliest evidence of writing, which obviously is in a written script, but Homer talks about or mentions writing. Right. And the thing about Homer is while, of course, it comes down to us in a written form, it is now good accepted fact that the composition of the poem was pre-literate, mm -hmm. right? And was so it was being composed in a society that didn't generally have writing. So to some extent, you wouldn't expect any mention of writing in it. Mm -hmm. And we don't have mention of it really in like the idea of writing down an epic or anything like that. There's no mm -hmm. idea of literacy in that sense. So there's one passage that does have elements of writing, maybe. <laughs> so it's, it's Iliad book six, and it's in the middle of a uh, complicated thing where Glaucus and Diomedes exchange armor. It's mm -hmm. an important scene. As part of this, they kind of exchange pedigrees and they end up finding out that they are guest friends by family connection. And that's why, so they won't fight each other. So right. they exchange armor to mark that. In the background of it, Glaucus, the Trojan, tells the story of his family and he tells the story of one of his ancestors who's Bellerophon. Bellerophon is famous elsewhere for having tamed Pegasus and fought the Chimera. Chimera. But the beginning of this has a story that is known as the Potiphar's wife motif after the similar story in the Bible. And I'll come back to that. Basically, the king of the country has a young queen who falls in love with Bellerophon. He rejects her. She accuses him of rape. And so Proteus wants to get rid of Bellerophon, but he's scared of him or doesn't want to do it himself. So he stopped short of putting Bellerophon to death. It was a thing he dared not do, but he packed him off to Lycia. So they're in a place in Greece is where they're starting off, but he packs him off to Lycia. So that's Asia Minor. Hmm. And that's important. With sinister credentials from himself, he gave him a folded tablet on which he had traced a number of devices with a deadly meaning and told him to hand this to his father-in-law, the Lycian king, and thus ensure his own death. So Bellerophon goes. When he reaches there, he's welcomed as an honored guest. But on the 10th day, he examined him and asked to see his credentials. When he had deciphered the fatal message from his son-in-law, the king then tried to kill him by sending him off to kill a monster. Okay, the rest of it's not important. He survives, in case you're worried. <laughs> so what are those fatal signs, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have to be writing. They certainly don't have to be alphabetic writing. But a folded tablet, I mean, that is exactly how writing was mm -hmm. done later. And the words that are used are, in the Greek, they're semata lugra, so semata signs. Mm -hmm. And that is word that is used later for writing. So it could be. So the passage has been, this I mean, from an article, the passage has been explained away as a dim memory of Mycenaean script or a reference to some primitive system of signing tokens or pictograms. Yet recent finds from the Near East convincingly suggest that the writing here is Oriental writing, as are the motifs and geography of the story. And I think that's a really interesting point. So that motif, it's mm -hmm. called the Potiphar's wife thing from the story of Joseph. Right. Where the same thing happens to Joseph when he's in Egypt. Yeah. His supervisor's wife falls in love with him, right? Yeah. And it's exactly the same. That part of it's the same story. It turns out elsewhere, of course. But there's a Semitic connection mm -hmm. to that story. And we know there's lots of Semitic connections, but specifically Semitic. And he's sent to Lycia, which is in Asia Minor. So in the Oriental, in the terms of that article, it's an old term, but in the Near Eastern context. So the idea that that story would be in that context, in the geography, with that motif, and include an understanding of writing that is a Semitic understanding of writing mm -hmm. that comes from the Phoenician or, or some other, seems very probable. I mean, you can't prove it. But so it, it seems could have probable. been borrowed from... So it could be that the whole story is borrowed, and therefore the concept of writing in it 
that Homer doesn't know what the writing is, right. but has borrowed the story with this idea in it mm -hmm. from this. And so just calls them deadly signs because they don't know what they are. Or that it's an understanding of Semitic writing that they don't, they still only use in these tiny little isolated ways that like a mm -hmm. king might use to send a message to another king, but ordinary folk aren't using and so wouldn't know. So anyways, it's just, an, it's mm -hmm. the only mention of writing, if it is a mention of writing, in Homer. Can they, because I know to some degree you can date bits of Homer as earlier <laughs> oh, don't later even, based on don't metrical. Don't even, don't even. What are you, some kind of analyst? <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know. It's short answer. And this article is trying to make some arguments about stuff and doesn't, doesn't appeal to an argument from dating the section. So right. I'm not going to, okay. I'm not going to say. I don't know. <laughs> uh, question of Homeric composition and dates thereof. <laughs> Don't even want to talk about it. But, you know, it, it is interesting because, of course, Homer is being written down around the same time. Mm -hmm. Like our dates for when is Homer written down are generally considered to be 8th century to 6th century. The alphabet comes in about the same time as some fairly reasonable dates for when Homer is first written down. I think these days people are leaning more towards a later date for mm -hmm. writing down towards the 7th and 6th centuries. So the argument isn't maybe as strong. You know, the idea that we get the alphabet and we get Homer being written down pretty much at the same time was a big part of the argument for that being the reason. Right. I don't know that that's quite as accepted now, but I mean, when you talk about the date of Homer, there's no such thing as accepted. So right. it's not wildly off. Let's put it that way. It's interesting that you mentioned this. It, it suddenly made me think of Beowulf, which also doesn't have any mention of, mention writing. of writing except... When, so after Beowulf kills Grendel's mother, mm -hmm. he uses this magic sword that he found there in, in her, her lair, lair yeah. underwater lair. And the blade of the sword melts away with her blood. Right. But he's left with the sword hilt, which uh -huh. he brings back to the court of Hrothgar. And it's not made it clear exactly what it is, but there's some kind of markings on the sword hilt that tell a story that they're not able to really understand. Huh. It's not clear if these are pictures. Right. I mean, that doesn't have to be writing, of course. Writing, mm -hmm. it's very vague. And if it is writing, they don't understand they don't it. Understand so, it. Yeah. So again, it might be some kind of vague understanding of writing by a non-literate person. Yeah. Now, of course, that there's all depends a whole on question. the dating of Beowulf. And there's the whole question of like Virgilian influence on Beowulf yeah. and stuff, which would obviously suggest a literate. But but again, Beowulf the story is older mm -hmm. than Beowulf the poem. Yeah. You know, oh, Babe with uh, the poem is who knows what you can make out of that. But anyways, there is that that nice parallel there. So yeah, no, interesting. Okay, and then I have one last little tidbit to end with, which is just a, a fun little myth about writing, which is that there is a flower that has letters on it <laughs> in Greek myth. Well, fun. It's not a fun myth. It's there's death in it. They all have death in them. There is a myth about a young boy, young Spartan prince called Hyakinthos, who is beloved of Apollo and of the wind Zephyros. So these two mm -hmm. gods both love him because he's beautiful. And so Zephyros is jealous because Apollo is winning. <laughs> and so Apollo and Hyakinthos are playing a game one day, maybe discus, maybe something else, some kind of throwing game. And Zephyr uses a gust of his wind to blow the disc off course and hit Hyacinth and kill him. Because, of course, when you're jealous, you kill the person you love. Right. Because that's Greek myth. Well, he couldn't kill the gods. So well, indeed. What is he going to do? So as Hyacinth lay dying, Apollo was so sad that he caused a flower to grow out of his blood. Mm -hmm. And the, f the flower is inscribed with the Greek words, ai, ai, alas, alas, mm -hmm. ai, ai. That's, of course, the hyacinth flower. Right. However, it's not the hyacinth flower yeah, that we think say, of. Is that the same no, species? No, it's not okay. the same species probably the, the larkspur or the iris. And I will put a link to this story on theoi.com and they have a picture of a larkspur and they have it like written with the letters written beside it, the alpha right. and the iota to so try to show you yeah. sort of how it works. I'm not certain about that. But anyway, but but the interesting thing is there's another there's another version of that story which says that that's not where that's that. So there seems to be a plant that they definitely think has the letters AI on it mm. because it's either named after Hyacinth or it's another flower or the Larkspur flower that has the AI because when Ajax, mm -hmm. the Greek hero, whose name in Greek is Ias, A-I-A-S, when he killed himself after being denied the armor of Achilles, after 
Trojan War, it's a big, long, complicated story, but he, he kills himself, that the flower sprang from his blood and it has his letters on it, AI, just of his name. So two different myths explaining these this alpha iota. So, so clearly like they definitely thought there was a flower that looked like an AI. I don't really see it in the Larkspur that, that shows it, but whatever. <laughs> so I just think it's interesting, though, because, you know, these are old myths then, mm -hmm. but they can't be that old if they suggest there's alphabetic letters on the flowers. Presumably. So that that story about Ajax yeah. would have been in the epic cycle. I mean, the story about enough. Ajax is in the epic is in well, the epic him, cycle. him wanting the the armor. and Oh, yeah, that's all in uh, we we know that is from the Odyssey and and like it's it's there early, but the detail the that a flower sprang from his yeah. blood, there's no particular reason to think that that was in an early in, version. In the, it's not yeah, in the Odyssey, okay. for instance. Right. So who knows when that gets added, right? If, and like that, we that, we only know it from survived. Ovid. <laughs> we only know it from Ovid, right? Yes. So yeah, yeah. like, pfft, it could be God knows when it comes along. So anyway, and same with the the Hyacinth story is all in late mm. authors to Ovid and Pausanias and Philostratus. So you know could have come at any time right. but but it's still interesting to find a myth that actually has letters like that right and that is everything i have to say for the moment about early writing in greece well i'll just add since you mentioned myths about the creation of writing mm -hmm. that there is a norse myth about about odin inventing Runes. runes. Right. So it's mentioned briefly in, in several sources about him inventing runes. And there's one sort of long passage in the Havamau about Odin gaining the knowledge of runes by sacrificing himself to himself, because of course right. he's the god of death. So you, when you sacrifice someone, you sacrifice them to Odin. So he has to sacrifice himself to, to himself, himself. Yeah. by hanging himself from a mighty tree, which is probably Yggdrasil, and piercing himself with a fearsome spear, probably Gungnir, his spear. And, you know, there's a description of the sort of pain and suffering of the this process. He So he's, he wants wisdom and he does yeah. all these, he sacrifices an eye. Yeah, to he get does all these things all these to things. get it. Yeah. yeah. And so this is one of the things he does. And from this, he gets the knowledge of runes. runes. And there, there may be even a reference to the same idea, even in Old English, because there are two, I think, two Old English texts that talk about the invention of runes by Mercury the Giant. Who would, of course, be the analog for Odin. For yeah. Odin, yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, that as I suppose, a piece of evidence or a suggestion that there might be magical elements to runes themselves, yeah. right? That he has to learn it in this really mm -hmm. complicated and sort of magical way, and Odin is associated with magic yeah. in lots of ways. So... If you still want more, more about <laughs> runes, there is actually a lot more to know, but I am probably not the one to tell you more. You should go to an expert, a runologist, and there is in fact a podcast just for that. Right. Uh, it's called The Runecast. Which is a good pun, right? Because yes. casting the runes. Casting the runes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I listen to it. It's, it's really interesting. It goes into lots of detail. So check that out. Right. And we'll put a link to that, of yep. course. Right. Well, I hope that that has been a nice distraction from the world. As I said, I'd, I'd love to say that we're going to be pumping these out, but we're not. <laughs> I don't even know when this is going to come out. As I said, we're recording on the 31st, though it is now yes, the were, first, yes. because we've gone over midnight by quite a long time. So I have to now edit it and yep. get it out. So I'm not quite sure how quickly that'll be. I'll try to do it quickly. But you in the future know exactly when it yes, is. Yes, you do. So we didn't really get a podcast out in March. This counts as our March one. But maybe we'll get another one out in April. I hope so. You never know. We'll see. Maybe we'll interview somebody else who's also isolated at home. <laughs> Closest to social interaction we're going to get. So yeah. we might as well do it. <laughs> All right. Be well, everyone. Stay safe. We are thinking of everyone and please do come and visit us on Lyceum and chat if you're looking for something to do. We'd love to talk about this episode or any others. Oh gosh, we have to think of a discussion topic. Quick. Would you like to be hung from a tree to learn about runes? Mm. No, let's not do that. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com alliterative. 
Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.